What's up guys, Doll Matter here, and today we're gonna be reacting to a new channel. So this is Task and Purpose, and it's a pretty big channel. It's got about a million and a half subscribers. Uh, they seem to do like geopolitical news. We've been asked to react to a couple different videos from them. Uh, this is the first one. It is US Navy deployed to stop Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. So this is from about two months ago when the whole Houthi situation kicked off. So it may be a little bit out of date, uh, but regardless, Let's kind of see what's going on. Uh, I know the general stuff of what's going on there, um, but when we get into like the nitty gritty details, I'm not as well informed. So link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. Things are going buck wild in the Red Sea right now. To counter Houthi attacks on cargo ships in the Red Sea, the United States announced they've put together an international coalition of 10 nations. What's at stake here? Preventing these Houthi attacks from blockading one of the world's most transited and important shipping lanes for the global economy. The task force includes the United Kingdom, Canada, Italy, who will send guided missile destroyers and aircraft carriers to try to secure the waters off Yemen's coast. This task force has been dubbed Operation Prosperity Guardian. But what prosperity is being guardianed? Take a look at the Red Sea behind me. Ten yeah, you gotta think all, like, especially up here, right? The, the um, I almost called it the Panama Canal. It's not the Panama Canal, it's the Suez Canal. Uh, the Suez Canal, so much trade goes through here, right? Almost all trade, from India and China, or I wouldn't, well, basically all trade from India and China that goes to Europe goes through this canal, along with a ton of oil coming from the Middle Eastern countries. 10% of all oil traded at sea passes through this route and about $1 trillion in goods annually. 15% of global trade passes through here. That's a lot of prosperity if you ask me. Since November 19th, 2023, Houthi factions in Yemen have launched 100 attacks with anti-ship missiles and attack drones aimed at civilian cargo ships. Houthis hijacked the Galaxy Leader, which is an Israeli-linked cargo yeah, ship, that. in a helicopter-borne raid. They still hold the ship and its 25 crew members hostage. Today, we're going to explore why all this- Honestly, that kind of blew my mind because, like, the way people were talking about the Houthis, I didn't realize that they had, like, access to, like, high-level military equipment, right? They obviously, like, come in on a helicopter with all these ships around. Um, you know, they are essentially the de facto government of uh, Yemen, right? And I said this in another video and people got mad at me um, because they're like, no, they're not the government of Yemen. Okay. De facto means they are, you know, as a fact, in charge of the country. Now, they don't control the entirety of the country, but they do control them. And they don't even control the majority of the country, but they do control the majority of the populated areas within the country. So, de facto, right? de facto versus de, de jure, de jure. Everyone says de jure, but technically in Latin, the J is silent, so it's de jure. Um, but, yeah, they may not by law be the official government by recognized by international law, but you know in reality they basically are, uh, which I did not realize until watching the uh, the Galaxy video, the the video on the the the, uh, the ship he was just talking about. It's Galaxy something. I can't remember the name of it. This blatant tomfoolery is happening. What the U.S. naval response is going to be based on expert opinions, and we'll talk about some of the geopolitical leader, factors in play. So the first thing you need to know is the main assets the United States Navy deploys in this region is the Arleigh Burke class destroyer. It's about 155 meters long and displaces 9,700 tons with heckin' 90 missiles on board. The guided missile cruiser can perform tactical land strikes with Tomahawk cruise missiles. So if they detect Houthi positions on land, they have the power to take them out. The USS Kearney, Thomas Hudner, and Mason Arleigh Burke destroyers have already been deployed in the region and they've intercepted and shot down over 38 munitions fired by Houthis since November. According to former Admiral Stavridis, the U.S. Navy will command the new task force through the existing Task Force 153, which is a counter-piracy flotilla based in Bahrain. This is one of five task forces, and it's dedicated to the Red Sea in part. These sailors on these ships have been on high alert, basically under daily attack from drones and missiles for the past month. The USS Laboon destroyer is also joining the team now. The coalition of ships sent are likely going to have a mix of interceptor missiles and tomahawks if they choose to destroy the Houthi rebel positions on land. Now, they also have a 5-inch Mark 45 main gun that fires a 68-pound munition 
that has a range of about 24 kilometers or 14 miles. This cannon can, can be used in different roles though, including anti-ship, anti-air, and naval gunfire support. It has a fire rate of 20 rounds per minute with 680 rounds on ship that can be used for close shore bombardment. According to this open source intelligence report that I found, there are five destroyers, an aircraft carrier, and two landing ships in the region already. And each of those landing ships has about 1,600 marine infantry that have all been stuck together at sea, trapped on that ship, and are just dying for an excuse to go to shore. Five destroyers, each with 90 missiles, with some average infantryman math, that's like 450 missiles so far. Another report from at Schizo Intel on Twitter shows NATO sub- <laughs> Schizo Intel, man. <laughs> I love the handles people have on Twitter. They're fucking hilarious. <laughs> Marines and additional vessels are already in the area. All these locations are approximate and purposefully outdated by like a week so as not to break any OPSEC or put anyone in danger. But it gives us an idea of the increasing level of firepower here. You know me, I'm a former U.S. Army infantryman, so I'm biased in favor of Israel and the United States and the West in general. Just putting my cards on the table so you don't feel like I'm hiding the ball when it comes to my perspective here. I can't help but feel some kind of way about all this, you know? I still do my best to present different perspectives here, though. We don't know for certain- Man, honestly, respect. I, I see so many people say that they're not biased. And it's so irritating because no matter what, you're going to have a bias, right? Even if you try your best not to have a bias, you're, whether it be like an ideological bias or religious bias, you know, just random preconceived notions, um, you're always going to have a bias one way or another. So it's, it's a lot more when people just admit they have one. I I, the one thing I do find really ironic, though, is a lot of the time the people that claim they have no bias are like the most aggressively biased people ever, right? That they like very obviously have like an aggressive agenda they're trying to push and they'll tell you, I'm not biased. It's just like very obvious that like everything in the world just conveniently aligns with my political opinion. <laughs> how many more reinforcements will arrive? But what we do have an idea about is how many more they would need to secure this area. Thanks to this informative article written by former Admiral James Stavridis for Bloomberg, I recommend you check it out. I put a link in the description to, and follow him on Twitter because he's probably the foremost expert when it comes to this mission. He's deployed numerous times as a captain of a guided missile destroyer. He led a carrier strike group in this specific region as a one-star rear admiral and fought Somali pirates in the 2010s. According to him, he believes this new mission in the Red Sea will be successful so long as they follow basic mission tenets. He points out this region of the Red Sea is massive. It's the size of California, about 1,400 miles, which means even if they sent 20 destroyers, they would have a tough time securing it without good intelligence. This is because it's like trying to cover the entire United States Pacific coast. However, I went and dug up some maps on the actual territory that Houthis control in Yemen. Okay, yeah, so I wanna go back to that map for a second, this one right here. So yeah, you have so this is Yemen. You have like the actual so okay, so it says right here. So you have contested territories, uh, G O Y G O Y inactive. Uh, I don't know what they mean by inactive, but yeah, G O Y is the government of Yemen. And then you've got the Houthis. You got the Houthis inactive. Uh, I'm guessing okay. So inactive must mean that there's no conflict going on there right now because it seems like the ones that are active are the ones that are near the front lines. Uh, National Resistance Forces, okay, which is the other group that's down here. And then STC. Uh, I'm not sure what STC stands for. But yeah, so the when we were watching the, the video on the Galaxy, the, the ship that was captured, um, the guy was explaining that even though they only control this small amount of territory, right, it's only about a quarter to a third of the country, this is actually like far and away the most densely populated. Something like 80 plus percent of the population lives here. So... Uh, this is like the official internationally recognized government of Yemen, the one that was the government before the Houthis started rebelling. And then, but the de facto government, right, because they controlled the most, the majority of the population, right, de facto versus de jure, uh, is the Houthis. Territory that Houthis control in Yemen. It's about 300 miles of territory along the Red Sea, although it is theoretically possible that they could attack from other locations. And given the max range of their missile systems, which is about two to 400 miles, this means just about the entire shipping lane does need to be protected. The former admiral points out the mission would benefit 
from allies joining the task force, like the UAE, who has a nearby port that can support the mission. He points out that working closely with civilian ships is necessary to maximize their limited resources. Private security teams on board could also go a long way in helping to counter Houthi attacks and deter them. But this begs the question, is this mission going to be entirely defensive? Are they just going to be going there and intercepting missiles? Or is it going to have an offensive role as well? Are they going to- I think they've already been shooting, like this is two months old, but I think they've already been shooting at Houthi targets, right? You have to get offensive because, I mean, you're just going to spend so much money if you just sit there and don't attack where they're launching the missiles from, right? You're just constantly shooting up, you know, missiles to intercept their missiles. Take the fight to the Houthis. What can we expect when we're expecting? United States security official John Kirby gave some insight into that, stating, quote, these attacks have to stop. They need to stop. The United States, our allies, and our partners will do what we have to do to counter these threats and to protect these ships. Now, if I were to read in between the lines, it sounds like to me, someone as uncultured as me, that the United States might be preparing to take the fight directly to the Houthis. This lines up with information that the Pentagon has recently moved the CVN-69 Nimitz-class aircraft carrier and its strike group into the Gulf of Aden. The naval commanders were reportedly given options for where to strike Houthi forces if that decision was made. What that tells me is that there's likely special forces operators and JTACs already on the ground inside Yemen observing Houthi locations right now. Their job would be to help guide air-to-ground bombs from the roughly 65 F-18 Super Hornets that are located on the aircraft carrier nearby. They can surge up to 240 sorties or missions in a single day during non-stop 24-hour emergency conditions. And it's not just me making a wild guess pulling stuff out of my ass here. I'm basing this off the U.S. White House statement to Congress that disclosed special forces are already operating on the ground in Yemen against ISIS terrorists. Just so you know, I'm going to be updating this information. It's a fluid situation, so follow me on Instagram at CappyArmy for those updates. So what kind of capabilities do the Houthis have? The Houthis use two different types of anti-ship ballistic missiles, called the Asef and the Tankil. The Asef, I believe, is the one that's based on the Iranian Fatah 313 missiles. It has a range of about 450 kilometers or 270 miles, but they probably would have to get closer if they want to be certain to actually hit. Allegedly, this missile uses GPS navigation to track a moving target like a ship. Dozens of their missiles have missed their targets entirely so far, and others have already been intercepted, but it's still concerning that two of the missiles did find their target and did strike ships. This munition has about a 300 kilogram warhead or 660 pounds, which is a large munition, certainly capable of downing a ship if it hits the right spot. Man, they have, a, they have one that goes like 1,400 kilometers, goddamn. Houthis also have short-range capabilities in their arsenal. There's the Falak missile, which can hit targets about 140 kilometers away. And according to Odin Yarin in his article, they have an anti-ship homing technology. Part of the capabilities of the coalition warships, though, that are headed to the Red Sea right now, include GPS jamming and other countermeasure decoys to fool these kind of Houthi missiles. We don't know for sure how many missiles the Houthis have, but we do know that in 2019, they launched 226 at Saudi Arabia that year, which should give us an idea that they could keep this up into 2024 if they aren't stopped. You might be surprised to learn, Houthis have been attacking ships here since 2015. This isn't anything new. With over 40 incidents where they use Chinese C-802 anti-ship cruise missiles, Houthis also fired at U.S. naval vessels in 2016, and the response back then was firing Tomahawk cruise missiles and hitting three Houthi radar command stations. According to Robert Talos, writing for thenationalnews.com, the Houthi missiles are most likely made inside Iran in separate pieces and then smuggled by boat into Yemen, where they're reassembled. Evidence for this comes from a U.S. security briefing in 2020 detailing how the Navy had found missile components headed to Yemen. A Houthi official was quoted as saying, quote, We have capabilities to sink your fleet, your submarines, your warships. The Red Sea will be your graveyard. But what are the Houthis trying to accomplish here? What's their end? <laughs> I honestly wonder, when you, when you have these countries release this, like, propaganda videos, like, do they actually believe that? Like, some of them I feel like they're actually fucking delusional enough to believe it. Like... 
Bro, you aren't beating the United States with, a, like, a couple hundred fucking missiles that only, get, like, oh my god. It's so funny. It's so sad, but so funny and so fucking stupid. Endgame, hypothetically. The Houthis have several possible motivations. First, they want to disrupt the global economy as much as possible. Second, they're likely trying to provoke a response from the United States that could lead to a wider regional war. And third, they want to use the attacks as a way to pressure Israel to suspend its ground offensive in Gaza. According to former Rear Admiral James Stavridis, more likely explanation is that Houthis are probing for weaknesses to set up future attacks by Iran against Iran? Western interests. He also points out that the assaults will likely cause oil prices to rise, which will benefit Iran and possibly increase Western pressure on Israel to scale back their campaign in Gaza. Houthi leadership made a statement on December 9th, and here's their quote. They said, if Gaza does not receive the food and medicine it needs, all ships in the Red Sea bound for Israel ports, regardless of nationality, will become a target for our armed forces. Evidence shows it's not just Israeli-linked ships, though. So far, 100 cargo ships have been rerouted. The 12 vessels attacked are linked to over 35 different countries around the world. Here's a graphic that I think does a good job of showing the different locations and timeline of the escalation of Houthi attacks over the past month by Damien Simon. Uh, drone attack, drone attack, galaxy leader board. I didn't realize the galaxy leader was boarded way up here. Um, uh, Ardmore can counter, change course to Yemen, order to change course to Yemen, change course to Yemen. Yeah, they just need to bomb these guys into the dirt. On, on Twitter. This is the Bab El Mandab Strait. And it's the most narrow point. It's only 18 miles or like 29 kilometers wide. What that means, it's basically like your local two-way suburban street that you drive down instead of a six-lane superhighway. 18 miles might sound like a lot, but for massive cargo ships that can weigh up to 100,000 tons, there's only two channels for inbound and outbound traffic. In military terms, this is a choke point or a fatal funnel. It makes your path predictable and therefore easier to target with anti-ship cruise missiles. The strait is located right next to Yemen. This vulnerability is why five of the world's top shipping companies have decided to take the longer route all the way around Africa and say see you later bye to that. Once these companies announced they would stop risking going through here, traffic through the Red Sea has now dropped by 35%, at least, and cost of insuring ships and cargo has doubled for those willing to venture through. Those costs are kindly passed on to, you guessed it, you and me, when we purchase things. The reason this hasn't made front page news in the United States yet is likely because many of the ships can still make it to their destination, just takes longer and costs more, and no one... Well, and, and it's not going to affect the United States near as much, right? Because you think about, there will be certain products, right, uh, that will affect, but almost, like, almost everywhere. Like, other than Djibouti and Eritrea, are there any countries that need to go to that, sh go through the strait to ship to the United States? Right, like if you're in Europe, it's quicker just to ship straight across the Atlantic. If you're in Africa, just ship straight across the Atlantic or go down, you know, the Cape and then ship straight across the Atlantic. If you're India or China, ship straight across the Pacific. Like, it, it just doesn't affect the United States nearly as much. Um, now, it, it doesn't, it, it affects the rest of the NATO countries, which obviously impacts the United States, but like directly for U.S. consumer prices. I don't think it'll have nearly as large of an effect as it will on Europe. Europe's definitely going to be the worst affected by this. Europe and uh, Europe and North Africa. And then the countries that are selling to them. It has yet been killed. If this continues and the attacks aren't stopped, you're going to see gas prices skyrocket and consumer good prices go up as well. But the main countries hurting here is going to be Egypt, who they have one-fourth of their whole economy depends on the transit fees that they earn through the Suez Canal. 15% of Europe's imported goods sail through here as well. The Houthis claim to be doing this to put pressure on Israel's economy, which relies on seaborne trade. Part of the reason this is kind of a perfect storm though right now is because another shipping lane is in trouble at the same time. A drought in Panama has meant that the Panama Canal doesn't have enough water, which means they've had to cut the number of ships they let through. When it rains, it pours, or that's a bad analogy. The Houthi rebels are backed by Iranian funding and weapon shipments, although Iran publicly denies this. If you ask me, 
personally, if you know, my, just my personal thoughts, I think Iran has learned over the decades that having plausible deniability is important. Because when the Iranian Navy planted sea mines in the Gulf of Aden to disrupt free navigation in the 1980s, and they hit a U.S. frigate, the U.S. Navy responded by destroying half of Iran's Navy in Operation Praying Mantis. So if you ask me, Iran learned to use the Houthi rebels to take the heat for them this time. Although, I should tell you that others claim the Houthis are acting under their own agency. So who is the Houthi movement? They're also known as Ansar Allah, or supporters of God. They're a Shia faction inside the Yemen civil war. In 2021, the Biden administration took the Houthi faction off the foreign terrorist organization list. They stated their reason for doing this was to ease tensions and help end the war there. But after the attack- <laughs> It obviously didn't fucking work out. Oh my god. Ugh, fuck me. Acts on civilian cargo ships, there's now increased pressure to return the group back to the terror list. During the Yemen civil war, the Houthis gained control over the Al Hudaya port in a major- We're gonna have to wait to see how effective US naval power will be, how large the coalition grows, he must have had to cut something out there. I wonder if whatever he said got blocked, because he's like, we're going to have to wait and see, and then... Yeah. So. Anyway, yeah, that was really interesting. It's, it's... I learned a lot of information. I didn't realize that they were doing operations, like, way up into the the Red Sea. I thought they were basically just operating off their coast. They, they actually have a lot more influence than I thought they did. Um, I'm so... Uh, I'm surprised the U.S. doesn't just bombed the fucking shit out of them, just carpet bomb the fucking... I guess the problem is, because they control most of the most densely populated areas, they're probably worried about civilian casualties, right? Because then that just radicalizes more people. It's kind of how you, got, you ended up with so many people being like associated with ISIS and shit in the first place, is radicalization through stuff like this, but... Uh, it seems It's such a pain in the ass to deal with these kind of guys. Uh, anyway... Let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.